can start recording. All right, welcome to Breaking Science, everyone. I see a lot of new uh, faces, if you will, in the room. Uh, so if this is your first time, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us. Tonight's speaker is Ali Irwin. Um, she's currently working at the New York Museum of Natural History. So we're really lucky to have her and, and this, uh, it's, it's one of the silver linings of this, um, you know, insanity and, and virtual experience that we have. Um, so her talk tonight is going to be about white nose syndrome and, and climate change and, and fungal disease. Uh, and it'll be really interesting. And um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I have in the past. So if anyone has questions, feel free to either type them in or, uh, you know, you can un unmute yourself uh, eventually. So with that, I will give the floor to Allie. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for making some time to uh, science with me. Um, as Jim said, my name is Allie Irwin, and tonight we're going to be talking all about white nose syndrome and the role of climate change in fungal disease. Uh, so first off, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So I got my bachelor's in behavioral biology from Boston University in 2012. Um, this major is a combination of a few different things. It's biology, it's it's animal behavior, psychology, and ecology all wrapped into one. So this picture of me was taken in 2010 outside of Johnson City, Texas, uh, during a three-week research trip that I uh, worked on. So that big box that's in front of me with the computer on it is a FLIR infrared camera, um, and it's filming the entrance of the cave that's behind me. And the GIF comes from the Bracken Cave in Comal County, Texas. It's the summer location of the largest colony of bats in the world, which is estimated at 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats. So that GIF is coming from the um, early part of the emergence um, on a summer evening. And I had the absolute privilege of filming there too. I don't have a picture of myself in front of this particular cave, but I uh, thought that GIF was pretty badass, so. Um, before I tell you any more about bats, I want to take a minute to just talk about this wonderful man. This is Dr. Tom Coons. I spent my time at BU as a lab and field assistant in his laboratory. Um, he's a world-renowned bat expert. He is well known for basically inventing the field of what's called aeroecology. Uh, scientists studying aeroecology study the interactions of living and non-living things that move and live in the sky. So it's kind of a special uh, version of ecology. So he was not only brilliant, but he was also a wonderful person. And he sadly passed away from COVID-19 on April 13th. Um, it's a huge loss to the community. Um, you know, most of the white nose syndrome research that I'm going to be talking about tonight absolutely just wouldn't exist without him. And on top of that, he was just, he was just a lovely man. Um, so it's a real loss and I thought it was appropriate to uh, just thank him here tonight this way. So a little bit about his lab. The PhD candidates and postdocs in his lab worked on um, gene flow, which is the variation, the way variation moves among different populations of organisms. And they use software to model how bats fly in groups when they're coming out of and going back into their caves. So that in particular was why we were using the infrared cameras um, first previous slide. One major focus though of this lab was white nose syndrome and that's what I'm gonna be focusing on mostly tonight. Now, as we start talking about bats, um, I'm gonna pause several times in the presentation to take questions. You can unmute yourself and ask or if you feel more comfortable typing into the chat box, you can do that at any time and in those, um, couple of parts of the presentation, I will stop and make some space for questions. Okay, so one of the reasons that I love talking about bats is their terrible reputation. I'm sure it's not news to you that a lot of people are afraid of bats. They've been very maligned creatures for a long time and right now is definitely not an exception. So I'm gonna start the evening by showing you a little bit of why I love bats and why you should too. So first off, bats are pollinators like butterflies and bees. They pollinate plants with flowers that are white or pale colored that bloom at night and that are bell shaped, which allows them to get their faces and their tongues deep down where the nectar is, just like that fantastic picture on the right. Um, in fact, bats responsible for the pollen nation of species of bananas, mangoes, chocolate, and even agave, which means all of you tequila lovers 
here in this presentation tonight should love bats. Over 500 different plant species rely on bats. And there's a lot of concern for the protection of bees because what would, have ha what would happen to the world's uh, food supply without them? So similarly, we should be feeling the same way about bats. I also just love that top left picture. He just is hilarious looking. Okay, so how many of you have ever let a spider just chill in your house because you knew that she would eat the flies and the other stuff that you hated more than you hated the spider? Well, bats do the same thing. They're an excellent means of pest control. They eat lots of species of insects that we consider pests like mosquitoes, moths, and even centipedes. They can significantly reduce the need for pesticides too in the ecosystem they live in. You got that guy on the left eating a cockroach and the one on the right eating a katydid that's kind of like the same size as the bat's body, which is amazing. Okay, so in addition to being good pest control and pollinators, they're really good indicators of the health of a particular environment. So they range in size, niche, and the type of ecosystem that they live in. And they're really sensitive to changes in the environment because of ecological problems they face, like agricultural development. So in fact, the National Park Service specifically uses bat species to monitor the health of Yellowstone National Park and has published a lot of material about why bats are a good indicator for that particular park, which is pretty neat. So the last reason that I love, well, one of the reasons I love bats, but the last one I'm going to present to you is last but not, certainly not least. Aw, so cute. Bats play a huge role in the scattering of seeds in their habitats. Fruit-eating bats pass seeds and then they drop them off in basically ready-made fertilizer, which is their guano. And these guys that you're seeing a picture of, these are tent-making bats, which live on the underside of giant folded over leaves in South and Central America. And the researchers who study them have found that the number of seeds that you can find under their tents is actually higher than the number that you would find due to random dispersal. So they are making a significant and noticeable impact on the dispersal of seeds where they live. Super cool. Okay. So this is pretty early on in my talk, but are there any questions about what I've touched on so far? You can feel free to type into the chat or you can unmute yourself and I'll give you just a couple seconds in case there are any questions. All right, let's keep going then. So now that we've talked a little bit about why bats are amazing, let's talk a little bit about the disease that is the topic of our talk. So what is white nose syndrome? White nose syndrome is a fungal disease that's caused by a, an organism called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which aside from being the coolest name ever, um, is a fungus that's endemic to Europe. And the first ever case of white nose was found in Howe Caverns, which is a cave that's open to the public that's in upstate New York, and it was found in 2006. So the cave explorers who found this particular disease, they saw some bats with this strange white growth around their ears, their wings, and their muzzle. And it was actually a whole year before biologists could even name and describe the disease. It attacks hibernating maternity colonies of females and baby bats. So what it does is it causes changes in the behavior of bats during hibernation. And the changes in behavior usually lead to either starvation or freezing related deaths of lots and lots of bats. Uh, any given impacted cave typically loses upwards of 90% of its bats if it has um, white nose syndrome fungus in it. Okay, so at this point in the research, we know that there's multiple means of spread. Once the fungus has gotten into a colony, hosts can fly it to new roosts and people spending time in the cave for any reason, whether it's researchers or tourists in the case of Howe Caverns, which is a, an operating tourist site, um, those people can transport it to new caves. Um, as a quick side note, researchers and um, other, you know, caving enthusiasts quickly picked up on this and there's been a huge campaign to work on what they sort of refer to as cave hygiene for, you know, cleaning the materials that you're using, cleaning your shoes when you leave a cave so that you're not bringing it into um, another cave. So they caught on to that pretty quickly and were able to make some changes. Okay, so let's take a look at what this looks like. 
So this picture shows an early detection test for um, white nose syndrome that uses UV light. The little pinpricks of yellow, those are all uh, the PD. I'm gonna refer to the fungus as PD. Um, these are all the PD spores growing on the bat's wing. So this bat, while its case is pretty new, it's fairly substantial. You can see those PD spores pretty much all over the wing membrane. So here's another look at it. This is another UV light detection on a wing, but this one has huge spore infiltration. This is further along in the progression of the disease. And on the left, you can see what a severe case looks like on a particular bat's face. It's pretty much obscured the entire face. You can even see spores traveling as far back as the um, back end of the bat's um, abdomen. So it's a pretty upsetting looking disease. I haven't included a lot of photos because of that reason. Um, there are plenty online if you're more interested in the disease and seeing more about it, um, but it's a pretty unpleasant looking disease. So even the bats that survive their first winter infected with white nose syndrome still come out with a lot of scars. So in this photo, you can see there's dead and dying tissue, there's holes, scars, and discoloration of the wing tissue. So this is a survivor. That, that's what they look like if they're able to survive the first winter. Okay. So I'm gonna walk you through the progression of the disease and the way that it works. So up in the right-hand corner, that is a picture of the fungus that causes the disease. That's P. destructans. So first off, just keep in mind that white nose attacks primarily hibernating bats for whom fat and nutrition is critical for survival. Once the tissue is colonized by the fungus, the bat's metabolism is going to increase, which means that it starts burning through calories and fat faster and then releasing carbon dioxide more slowly. This is going to lead to that carbon dioxide building up in the blood, which causes the blood's pH to drop. So this is a huge problem for a bat that's infected with white nose syndrome. And in order to resolve it, the bat's body will come out of hibernation early and the bat will hyperventilate to correct for the low excretion of CO2. This causes the bat to lose water, electrolytes, and then most importantly, those energy and fat reserves that they've been saving to get through the winter. So this cycle where the bat's body aims to make up for the initial symptoms typically results in dehydration and loss of body mass. Sometimes individuals fly out into the open to look for food to stop them from starving. Um, obviously these bats are not equipped to be out in the winter in the middle of um, you know, a lack of food. And they've also at that point already lost a lot of body mass, a lot of fat, so they're especially not equipped to be there. And this often results in an individual freezing to death um, and if they don't freeze to death, the animal usually starves due to a lack of available food and, you know, due to this fact that they've degraded the condition of their body down from the way they started the winter to where they would hopefully end the winter, but it's in the middle of winter. So I want to point out that while my diagram makes it look like getting white nose syndrome means death, some individuals are able to survive until spring. However, the mortality rate is unfortunately very high. Okay, so that's a little bit about how the disease works. Let's gain a little bit of context for the damage that's been done so far. So about five years ago, it was estimated that white nose syndrome had killed about 6 million bats and traveled over 2,000 kilometers from upstate New York. This is now estimated at about 6.6 .6 million, and 13 out of North America's 47 bat species are affected, and all 13 are species of hibernating bat. So if you've got a species in North America that is not hibernating, they're not currently being impacted by this disease. One thing to point out, taking a look at this diagram, is here in the purple is the sort of epicenter. This is where uh, this disease was found. That's how caverns in upstate New York. And if you take a look at the legend, basically you go from cool colors to warm colors to see the spread out from this central point. And I'll come back to this diagram in a minute. Okay, so 
In particular, the little brown bat has taken a nearly 90% hit in northeastern hibernation sites. And I can tell you personally, in the two years that I spent doing field work, I was spending most of my time in what is considered primary uh, little brown bat territory. You can see what their normal range is on the left, but up in northern Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire, you know, most of the bats that you're going to see before this all started to happen, most of the bats that you would see were little brown bats. So uh, the fact that I had, I can say that I saw fewer than five individuals in my whole two years of research there is um, very disturbing to say the least. Okay, so back to this doc, uh, diagram. So you can see from taking a look that there are now confirmed cases through 2020 as far south as the border of Mexico and Texas, and as far west as Washington State, as far north as Winnipeg, and as far east as Newfoundland. Um, I will note that the data points out here on the west coast still have some experts kind of baffled, and they're pretty sure that this is due to human spread, um, due to this huge swath of land between what's going on in the middle part of the country and what's going on, on the west coast. So to try to get ahead of the next impacts of white nose, some scientists have been doing some modeling and they've determined in their most pessimistic results that about eight species of bats in the Northeast would suffer a loss of over 25% of their population. And it's believed that in the next moves of this fungus could be into mountainous and coastal areas as well as the Mississippi River Basin. And now, being super nerdy about data and genetics, I actually think that this data is way more interesting when you think about genetics. We now know that all of the P. destructans across the U.S. is nearly genetically identical. Excuse me, identical. Um, that basically supports the idea that this fungus is spreading by cloning or, you know, asexual means across the U.S. And that could be really good news for bats because low genetic diversity should make it easier for bat species to develop some kind of resistance. Um, but unfortunately, we also know from studying this particular fungus species that's actually originally from Europe, that it can reproduce sexually if it needs to. Um, so we know that in Europe, this fungus is non-parasitic. So it grows on dead tissue rather than live tissue and reproducing sexually would make for greater genetic diversity and would stop bats from being able to fight back and develop some kind of resistance. Um, so that's one thing that's very interesting that you can see really only when you look at the genetics. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there for a second and I'm gonna take questions. Now I see that there are some things in the chat, so I'm going to first look at those. Uh, can the holes in the wing tissue repair or are the holes permanent? That is a great question that I'm actually going to answer in just a little bit. So I'm going to ask you to hold on to that one. Um, how do they come count the number of bats in a cave slash colony? That is an excellent question. It is very tough. <laughs> one thing that they can do is they can study the, um, the layout of the cave and learn about how many chambers there are. Bats tend to roost very far back in the back chambers of the cave for protective reasons. Um, so once researchers know the general size of the cave, they can um, film an emergence and sort of do some computer modeling. Um, an emergence meaning uh, in the evening when all of the bats come from the cave. They come from the roosting chambers, fly out and do their night of hunting before they return for the night or for the daytime. Um, so what they can do is combine their modeling of the layout of the cave with the numbers that they can count using something like thermal filming, like the work we did uh, during an emergence, and that allows them to um, make sort of an, a general estimate of how many bats are living in that particular cave. But it is worth noting, I said in the beginning, that Bracken Cave is estimated at being about 20 million bats during the summer. Um, it's, it's very hard to verify that number. <laughs> that's, that's a good estimate that researchers have made. Oh my gosh, so many great questions. Um, okay, does this fungus still cause this issue in bats when it's not winter? Is the deadly part the fact that hibernation is disrupted? Yeah, the, overwhelmingly the hardest part about this is the fact that the bats are so vulnerable because they're hibernating and they're not prepared to um, 
fight back and generally they don't wake up until they're far enough progressed into the disease that it causes some serious problems. Um, so that is the probably one of the deadliest parts of the disease. And then the next question is sort of about the same thing. Um, it does have to do with the immune system being suppressed, the fact that they're not awake, they're very highly vulnerable. Um, so those are a couple of, of points that are important to note. Ali, can I add something that I didn't know until I looked it up today because I thought this was really interesting? Please do. So uh, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm, I'm an immunologist, but I really know nothing about bats other than what I Googled because I knew this talk was coming. So the type of uh, immune response that protects you against the fungus uh, it, it can actually interfere with the ability to hibernate. Um, so bats that don't hibernate have more effective uh, what what everyone would call it, type three response or something, um, than than non hibernating bats. So I wonder if that's like part of the issue. Yeah, like and important that you don't evolve an immune response to to fight fungi effectively, so that you don't wake yourself up. Right, that's a really good point. Is that you know hibernating animals? Um, pretty much every system in their body shuts down as much as it possibly can to focus on what they need to focus on to get through the winter. So bats that are hibernating are as shut down as they possibly can be, which makes them vulnerable. And it also means that their immune system isn't functioning the way that it, um, you know, the, uh, at, at peak sort of functioning, the way that it would if they were awake. Um, thank you for adding that, Jim, it's helpful. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't understand bat immunology at all. But, cause they, <laughs> apparently they do also make antibodies, but those are not, uh, like correlative with protection. They do. And um, I'll sort of touch on this at the very end, but they also are um, considered to be among the animals with the best immune systems in the world. They can handle some serious disease without uh, succumbing. They have really great immune systems. Um, and then I have another question about the amount of biomass that a bat can eat across its lifetime. Wondering how many more insects would be around without a healthy bat population. Yeah, there is absolutely, um, it is reasonable to say that more decimation of bat populations would yield a significant difference in the amount of insects that we are dealing with, which, I mean, I like bats more than I like insects. <laughs> um, at least those pest insects that they eat. Uh, so we want to keep them around. I'm not sure what the amount of biomass a bat can eat across its lifetime is, though. That's a fantastic um, question and a good, a good research. Uh, topic. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going and there will be a couple more um, places where you can ask a question if you have them. Feel free to continue sending them in the chat though as they come up. Okay, so when it came up about the wings healing in one of the previous questions, this is kind of what I'm going to talk about right now. Um, so what are scientists doing or considering doing to help stop the spread of white nose syndrome? Well, when I was still working at the Coons lab, scientists were trying to develop a vaccine that could protect bats from the onset of this disease. And eight years later, there's a lot more progress. Also, side note, I kind of love the idea of trying, someone trying to run around and vaccinate bats. Um, I don't, do not know how you would do that, uh, but it's kind of amusing to, to think about. Um, okay, so what are scientists doing? So first off, researchers have figured out that one of P. destructin's weaknesses is sunlight. This fungus apparently is missing part of its DNA sequence that would repair UV inflicted damage. So one idea that's been proposed is constructing UV light tunnels in big cave systems that would require bats to fly through them on their way to their roosting chambers, which are in the back of the cave. Um, this idea is very much still in the suggestion phase, <laughs> probably at least in part because these would be massive, very expensive projects to construct. Um, but I would think that knowing what we know about Bracken Cave being one of the biggest and the fact that Bracken is also run by a uh, bat conservation group and that's who owns it, I would think that that would probably be one of the first places that they would try that um, once the technology is available. Uh, can't stress enough though, it is not yet there. It's just an idea right now. So some other scientists are coming at it from more of a chemical angle. Studying fungi, some experts have found that there's something called mushroom alcohol, and this is a chemical that's released by some mushrooms when they break down organic compounds. They've figured out that mushroom alcohol can stop the growth of PD. 
Uh, similarly, another, there's another antimicrobial compound that plants produce called leaf aldehyde, and that also stops the growth of this particular fungus. Now, figuring out how you use those compounds is a little more challenging. So this is also still in um, suggestion phase, so to speak. However, I'm gonna talk a little bit about something that is past suggestion phase and is very real current science. So there's some quite a bit of data about bat resistance, and that's particularly in the area of wing tissue regrowth research. And I'm also really excited to share this research with you because the author of this article is the PhD candidate that I worked for in college. His name is Nate Fuller, and he is currently working as the Texas Park and Wildlife's chief bat expert, which might be the coolest job title I can think of. Uh, he and his team, including myself, worked in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to recapture bats that were damaged by white nose syndrome in the winter. We were capturing them over the summer. So bats were captured once in June and then again in August. When they were captured at the beginning of the summer, researchers did a full analysis of white nose syndrome damage. We surveyed for holes, receding membranes on wings, dead tissue, discoloration, took tons of photos. So the teams doing this work found that 78% of the bats that were recaptured had healed significantly just between June and August. The individual in this particular picture is a perfect example. You can even see that within the red circle, the ripped section of her wing has healed itself up back again nearly perfectly. Uh, also, all the discoloration, all the holes, all of that is gone. Her wing looks beautiful. It's got a couple of little scars here and there left, but uh, overall, it looks like a different animal, and that is the same animal just two months later. They also even found that Believe it or not, the tissue regeneration is most impressive in bats that have the worst damage. So the worse the scarring, the uh, more impressive the um, healing later. So to give you even more updated information, because this uh, particular data is pretty old, there was another study published in February 2020 that shows that there's been some changes to the genes in these bats that's associated with um, fat depletion and arousal from hibernation in the little brown bat. And that's the species most devastated by this disease. So if you remember, loss of fat and waking early are two huge parts of the progression of this disease. So finding out that there's been some changes in what we're seeing in the genes would really indicate that there's some evolutionary adaptation happening, which is very exciting. Um, so it's important to note that all of the interest in this disease is not limited to the implications it has for just bats. It's one example of a few different pathogenic fungi species that appear to be sort of changing the face of the landscape in the last few decades. So I'm gonna talk about two other fungi very briefly that have, are having a similar impact. Okay, so as PD devastates bats, We've got another fungus called O. ophiodicola, which targets snakes. So both fungi share some basic traits about where they're found, the conditions under which they grow best, and how they metabolize what they eat, so to speak. So O. o eats keratin, which is the material that makes up snake scales as well as human hair and fingernails. So just like with white nose syndrome, the disease causes um, surface disfigurement of all kinds to the tissue. And with snakes, it's got a nearly 100% mortality rate. Um, I will also just warn you, um, O. ophiodicola is very interesting, um, but the pictures, if you were to Google it, and this is why I did not include them here, are rather graphic and kind of disgusting. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an ugly disease. So just, you know, if you Google, Google at your own risk. Um, so other similarities even come down to just where you can find them. You can see in this particular diagram that the snake fungus can be found in a lot of the same places as our white nose syndrome fungus. So that makes researchers, you know, scratch their head and wonder what's going on. So the other I'll talk about a little bit is chytrid. You may have heard of chytrid before. It refers to a fungus that can be found wreaking havoc basically on every continent except Antarctica. So I'm personally highlighting the spread in Central America for a couple of reasons. So one, the research into combating chytrid has traditionally prioritized Central America. And two, the incredibly important diversity of amphibians in this part of the world 
means that battling this disease is in, in this part of the world is just, is super key, it's, it's critical. So once again, just like the um, Ophiodicola fungus, chytrid shares some of the same characteristics in its origin as a harmless organism, its low genetic diversity, and the fact that it basically will infect any amphibian that it can. However, one particular type of frog has been found to be a bit resistant. This little guy is from the genus Diasporus, and he's from Panama. And they found that the survival rate for infected and uninfected frogs is about 96%, which shows that they've developed some kind of resistance. Plus he's super cute, look at that little face. Any questions before I keep going? I see two more. So are the ones that recover more resistant? That is a really good question. Um, there hasn't been a lot more, interestingly enough, the healing papers almost entirely come from the lab that I worked in, and in particular, the PhD candidate that I worked with, um, Nate Fuller. And so that data hasn't been fully compiled yet in terms of looking for like reinfection rates. Um, but that is a really good question. Um, can mushroom alcohol or leaf aldehyde be manufactured or cultivated? That's also a really good question. Um, I think that's being looked into right now. They really have only done that work on a very small scale in, you know, lab petri dishes. Like we're, we're talking very, very small scale. Um, my uninformed person can say that I would not be surprised. I would think that that would be something that could be um, replicated, but I'm not sure. It's a really good question. Uh, did we ban these bats as well for continuous monitoring? Yes, um, all of the bats that were studied by um, the team at the Coons lab were banded. And um, it was actually very funny. Some of those bats that we recaptured to see what, how they were doing with healing, were sort of inadvertently captured more than two times. <laughs> um, they just sort of kept coming back. Um, so yes, we, did, we do continue to see the same individuals and they did get banded um, so that we could keep checking on them and seeing how they're doing. I've got one more quick question, if you don't mind. Go for it. Do you know, is there a biomarker or something that would predict which bats are going to die from the infection and, and which aren't? That is a really good question. I don't know if that, uh, you know, in doing my research to uh, prepare for this, I didn't find any data on any biomarkers indicating, you know, um, a particular susceptibility. The pretty much the, the highest extent of genetic work that's been done thus far on this is in finding those small changes in uh, gene variation about fat and um, arousal from hibernation. It also includes vocalization, which I think is interesting. Um, and I'm not sure the scientists looking at that have figured out why is the, you know, the gene variation for vocalizing changing. That they're not really sure about. And this is all, that's all very recent research. That paper was published in February. Um, but that, it's a really good question. I don't think that that's been discovered quite yet. Cool, thanks. We need some more um, bat immunologists. Okay. Um, and yes, it would absolutely be nice if there was a database um, for this stuff. Um, there is, I will say that the bat studying community, which that's just a great phrase, uh, the bat studying community is a very tight knit group of people. Um, if you become familiar with any of the work, you will see some of the same names pop up over and over again. There's even a yearly bat research council. Um, it's like a big conference that happens every single year. Uh, it's a very tight knit community. So, um, I, and I haven't been part of that community for some time now, but I would bet money that there is some way of, uh, a, a more formal way of sharing some of their information, um, simply because of how incredibly tight that community really is. Okay, so the last part of my topic is really about climate change. And this might seem like kind of a, um, a pivot, but really, a lot of experts who are studying this type of work and looking at the way these fungal diseases are progressing are wondering about the um, possible impact that climate change is having. What, what influence is it having? So 
first, an increase in temperature can increase the geographic range of a fungus that already attacks living creatures. Increasing temperatures in areas that have previously been too cold or unseasonal for certain fungi species could now become tolerable. And the same impacts could be had in areas that aren't just warming, but are becoming more humid. And additionally, species that are non-pathogenic and can tolerate temperature fluctuations could actually become selected for, meaning that they begin surviving better than their competitors. So this can allow for more harmless fungi that are like P. destructans, O. ophiodicola, and chytrid, all which are originally harmless. This could cause those harmless fungi to choose living hosts, which is a little worrisome for experts. Okay, so many scientists across the globe are currently using modeling to predict how climate change could impact species distribution in particular areas. So for example, here's the Chinese caterpillar fungus. This is a type of cordyceps fungus. If you've ever heard of cordyceps, they're sometimes affectionately referred to as the zombie ant fungus by the people who love them. The picture on the left is showing a part of the fungus that you would see above the ground, and on the right is what earns this type of fungus its nickname. <laughs> Part of its life cycle is inside the body of the Chinese caterpillar before it bursts through the body of the animal, obviously killing it. So anyway, the group that studies this fungus has determined that there is a strong probability of a major expansion of this fungus's range and their numbers as climate, uh, excuse me, continues to change. So this is according to some very intense modeling theory that they have. So it's not a, a sure thing, but their modeling would indicate that this particular fungus is going to become way more common in way larger an area. So we can kind of use that to sort of inform some of our thinking. Obviously different fungi species are, are different, but that gives us an idea of what might be happening in some fungi species. So there's also a lot of research being done around human illness and its relationship to climate change, but it's not always through a temperature related mechanism. So the American Lung Association reported a significant rise recently in a disease called valley fever. This is a fungal lung disease. The fungus that causes the disease lives in the soil and it can get kicked up by things like farming, construction, dust storms. Most of the cases in the United States come from Arizona and from California. And it's now believed that climate change is causing an increase in frequency of dust storms in this region, and thus the increase in valley fever diagnoses. And side note, it is a huge increase in diagnoses. It's over 100% increase in just a handful of years. Um, so it can be pretty nasty, and we actually know fairly little about fungal diseases. But thankfully, in 2018, California approved an $8 million boost to do some research on valley fever in particular. So it's not like nobody knows anything and no one's doing anything. Thankfully, there is something being done. We're doing some research, so we'll be able to learn more. Okay, so some of the other research around fungi and climate change is looking at the food supply chain. So in 2016, the World Health Organization published some warnings around substances created by fungal mold that are called mycotoxins. Recent research shows that higher CO2 and higher temperatures means an increase in mycotoxin growth. Now, what does this have to do with our food supply? Well, cereals, nuts, spices, dried fruits, coffee, cocoa, and red wine can all contain mycotoxins under warm and humid conditions. And that's likely to increase as climate change impacts increase. Another toxin produced by mold is called aflatoxin. And those can cause cancer. The fungi that produce aflatoxin grow on peanuts, wheat, corn, beans, and rice. And there's already data that shows that aflatoxin poisoning and liver cancer that's a result, those cases are higher in Asian countries where people heavily rely on maize in their diet. So that's hence this picture. This is a maize farm in Southeast Asia. So the other concern when it comes to these toxins is the role corn plays in factory farming in countries like our own. Feeding corn that contains mycotoxins to pigs that are then slaughtered and eaten by people is very conceivable and also very dangerous. One thing to note though, is that we've known about these toxins, specifically myco and aflatoxins since the 1960s. This is not new. 
The World Health Organization has been working with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, to set up tons of ways to advocate for food safety around the area of fungal mold toxins. So not, don't be worried that this is brand new and nobody knows anything about it. The World Health Organization has been working on this for quite some time. Now, I feel like I've been talking a lot about the downsides of fungi and giving them kind of a bad rap, but perhaps they can also be part of the solution. So part of the regular function of fungi is to absorb CO2 and store it underground. And this helps reduce the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere, which is invaluable in the fight against climate change. And that's why some experts call fungi climate warriors. Now, can learning more about the relationship between climate and fungi help us to slow the effects of climate change? Now, by the way, I really love this picture because it shows what most of the body of a fungus looks like. The part we see above the ground, the, you know, the mushroom or toadstool, whatever you call it, is just a small fraction of the actual fungus. And most of it is underground and looks like this, which is pretty cool. So other parts of the world are turning toward a more direct use of the capabilities of fungi. Scientists at a Kew Gardens lab in London recently began releasing the wonderfully named State of the World's Fungi Report, which I just love. Um, in it, they revealed amazing new information just a couple of years ago. A study done in Pakistan found that there's a species of fungi that can digest plastic. This is a picture of that fungus growing in a Petri dish. It's a kind of food mold. So it just imagine all of the things we could do with a fungus that eats plastic. Just amazing. So finally, can fungi protect other organisms? Now, believe it or not, Monsanto, yes, that Monsanto, is sponsoring research right now into using fungi to protect plant growth from pests and bacteria. Basically, the fungi parasitizes the pest species and acts as a sort of bodyguard for the plant itself. So this picture shows the beneficial impact of fungi. You can see the grass growing on the left is doing so much better in the presence of fungi. It's pretty cool. Now, all of this science is very much still developing, which is one of the reasons I think it's so interesting. There's still tons of room for world-changing discoveries that shift the course of the entire narrative and you know, the course of the world. Overall, what we're seeing in impact all around is that climate change is massively impacting fungal species and other species all around the world, and will continue to have impacts that we can and impacts that we can't predict. And our scientific communities need to work fast and smart to learn ways to uh, move forward and try to solve some of these problems as they occur. Now, as we finish up, I do want to say one single thing about our current pandemic, and then I'll allow for questions. Now, while bats may be a possible source of the novel, um, novel excuse me, coronavirus, um, they're not to blame humans are. Protecting and keeping a safe distance from bats can help prevent this from happening again, and bats definitely need our protection. And who knows, maybe we'll find that like the fungi, bats can be part of finding the solution um, to things like coronavirus in the future. And with that, I will open up the floor to any other further questions. Are bats awesome? Yes, they are. Bats are awesome. <laughs> what is my favorite bat? Um, I think my favorite bat is the vampire bat, um, not because of the obvious things that everybody knows about them, but because when I did my study abroad program in New Zealand in college, I ended up working for, I ended up working for someone that I didn't know knew Dr. Tom Coons. Um, I wasn't placed in that lab because of Tom. Um, I ended up there by, you know, accident. And he had written a textbook with Dr. Coons years prior. And his name is Stuart. And Stuart's research was primarily into vampire locomotion. 
So vampire bats do something that uh, we don't see them doing. We don't really have an opportunity to see them doing it that often. So a lot of people don't know, uh, but they can run on their folded up wings using the uh, joints as their feet. So they sort of run um, almost like, if you think of like ape knuckle walking, they run on the joints of their wings all folded up. Um, and Stewart's research was all filming those bats running on tiny little treadmills, which you can find GIFs of it if you search for it. If you Google like vampire bat treadmills, you will find GIFs of little tiny vampire bats running on tiny little treadmills, um, which I think sounds like one of the funniest things you could study. Um, so those are my favorite probably vampire bats and my favorite fungus um, there's a t weird type of fungus that in its natural state looks like it is bleeding, which is really super creepy and really gross, but really cool. Um, you can check that out too. Um, I'm actually not, I can't remember what it's actually called, but it is, it is like a pink fungus that has like dots of a red blood like, um, gel basically on the surface. So it looks like it's bleeding. That's a pretty cool fungus. Ah, bleeding tooth fungus. Yep, that would be it. <laughs> really, really gnarly, but really cool. Oh, and I didn't know that about original, uh, this original Star Trek costume. Ears and noses were based on bats. That's pretty cool. Um, Dr. Coons used to dress up every year as a bat for Halloween. The same costume, just a, you know, little cape he tied around his neck and a little, um, uh, headband that he put some ears on and he used to wear that every single year no matter what same question or excuse me same costume great thank you so much Ali for that awesome talk and thanks uh, everyone in the audience for asking really great questions I feel like now is a really good time to uh, leverage uh, politicians' awareness of infectious diseases and stuff for ad to, ad to advocate for uh, climate change mitigation strategies. Because um, as you've alluded to, fungal diseases really are no joke. Um, they really are. And I mean, you can probably speak more to that, but uh, we really don't know as much about fungal disease as we do about other types of diseases. They're, they're less studied. Yeah, and uh, to my knowledge, there are no FDA approved uh, fungal disease vaccines. Not that there shouldn't be able to be, but um, right. it's, it's certainly not easy. Yeah. But it's good to know people are doing the research, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Great. So, too, if there are more questions, I will hang out for a little bit. Yeah, and if anyone um, <clears throat> is interested in coming next week, same bat, if you'll excuse the pun, same bat time, same bat place. Uh, it will be Wednesday, 8 p.m., uh, Cutting Edge Cancer Therapeutics. Very nice. And anybody who's interested, um, uh, it's been pointed out in the chat, anyone who's interested in Dr. Coons and the work that he did, um, there is a fantastic obituary for him in the Boston Globe. There's also one on BU's website, BU Today. Um, that speaks a lot about the person that he was, the research he did, and his character. Um, so if you're interested in him, um, there's a lot of information you can read about him online. He was an amazing person.